fundraiser and all the things leading up to the canonization in Rome on the 4th of September. We will be showing you testimonies, music, events and a lot more. The channel was inaugurated on the 12th of June by the Vicar General of the Archdiocese of Calcutta, Father Dominic Gomes. In the days of old, um, this is we us, communicated your, your strength to our ancestors, to the prophets, and the fullness of time, you spoke to us through your son, Jesus. He taught us the mysteries of the kingdom through simple stories of life. In our own times, we are challenged to make real your life-giving word through numerous means of social communication. Mandated by the local church to take up the challenges and explore the opportunities offered by social communication for evangelization and for the good of all and responding to artists Norway, we humbly endeavor to provide an overall plan for the use of the mass media, both traditional and new media and new evolving technologies which may be appropriately utilized. We believe it is ability and a responsibility of the church to use these media to promote community life, spiritual growth and proclamation of the gospel, contributing to vibrant church, participation in the life of our nation and the welfare of all humanity. This evening, as we inaugurate the Blue Stripes Internet TV channel, so as to highlight the wonderful deeds of Blessed Mother Teresa, and as we go on with the intensive preparation towards her canonization, first of all, we thank you, Lord, for the precious gift of our dearest Blessed Mother Teresa of Calcutta, who will be canonized in this jubilee year of mercy. You chose her to be your presence, your love and compassion to the brokenhearted, the unwanted and the abandoned and the dying. She responded wholeheartedly to your cry, I thirst by the holiness of her life and humble words of love to the poorest of the poor. Lord, to this channel, we want to explore these good works of Blessed Mother Teresa, inspiring many more people around the world, so that we may wish to proclaim your good news to all. Heavenly Father, help us to understand and communicate the power of your work. Enable us to use the modern means you inspire to communicate your love so that all might experience the fullness of life in Jesus, the word eternal. Amen. Glory to the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That was the beginning. The Lord be with you. And the Almighty God bless all of you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So this afternoon, we have Mr. Gautam Lewis with us, who's going to tell us about his story. So sir, before getting into your story, tell us what you do presently. Well, I'm here in Calcutta to take pictures and to make a documentary about memories of Mother Teresa. So at the moment, I have my photography and filmmaker's hat on. Okay. So sir, could you tell us a little about your experience with Mother? Though it goes a long way back, but we would really like to know. Sure. Um, I was born somewhere between here and Harrow, okay. but when I was around three years old, I had caught polio and for the reasons of poverty and geography and all sorts of other complications, my original family couldn't look after me. 
So I was rescued by Mother Teresa at around three years old. And I originally started where there was a boys home in Dum Dum. And then I went to Shishivavan next to Mother's house. And I lived there for five years until I was seven before I left for New Zealand. So how was your experience at Shishivavan? Um, at the beginning, I can imagine I was quite confused and I think I often get homesick from certain places. So when I left Shishivavan, I missed Shishivavan. Um, I remember every Sunday we'd all get dressed up and go to church, which was a highlight. And one of my strongest memories was flying kite from the roof and always wanting to be on the aeroplanes that I used to see flying around. Um, but the greatest thing about being at Shishivavan was I was given life. So, sir, could you elaborate on how mother played a role? Well, if she didn't um, show the love that she did and still does, I wouldn't be alive here today. So the greatest contribution she's given to me is to give me a chance to have a different destiny. So sir, uh, how did Patri Ma'am Patricia Lewis play a role in shaping you up today? So Patricia um, volunteered initially with the Child in Need Institute, or CINE, and that led her to meet the late Jane Webb, who received an OBE and eventually became a uh, Indian citizen. And she set up the Rehabilitation Centre for Children. And what they used to do, so between CINE and RCFC, they would go around the orphanages and other uh, uh, homes for disabled children and non-disabled ch children, and they would look for children that they could take and provide all sorts of rehabilitation, whether it's corrective surgery or assistive devices like orthotics or wheelchairs or crutches. And when Trisha and Jane came to Shishivavan, they saw me there and clearly I needed um, medical surgery. So they arranged it with the, with the sisters that I could still be in their care, but I used to go over a two year period to have corrective surgery at RCFC. Now, when you are going through rehabilitation from surgery, it can take up to six months. And quite often you're in a room on your own where all the other children are playing outside. And I clocked and I worked out that Patricia was a cat lover. So whenever there was a cat near me, I would just take it and gently strangle it and that would get Trisha's attention so she would come and have to sit with me and that, that was a way for me and her to start to create a bond. So over the two year period um, she was living in Calcutta and still to this day I'm sad to say that I've lost my Bengali but she still speaks Bengali and Hindi and um, towards the end of her time in Calcutta her idea was to sponsor my education but what she what everyone said to her was actually what I need is a mother and someone to love me okay. and nothing ventured nothing gained that's probably what she will say so sir do you have any memory that you would particularly like to talk about with where mother is concerned not more than what I've said in terms of the fact that I was given love, I was given a home, I was made to feel part of a family. These are all really important things to have life. And um, I got an education, um, I had shelter. Um, if I hadn't had all of those things, arguably I might not even be alive. So the greatest gift anyone can give you is, is a second chance to have a life. So would you be grateful to Shishu Bhavan for shaping you up today? Absolutely. If not Shishu Bhavan, um, the Missions of Charity, the Rehabilitation Centre for Children, CINE, all the volunteers at Shishu Bhavan, all the doctors, physiotherapists, and um, I guess my love of Bengali food, which are my favourite, well, samosas, light cheese, mangoes, things like that. Um, but certainly during this trip, I have felt much more connected 
to being a Bengali. Whereas before, I just wasn't sure. But um, I'm here on my own, and I've made lots of friends. And I'm just starting to feel just how warm and meaningful and loving and funny and crazy people in Calcutta are. Um, but it's, it is an overloading of senses, but that's not a bad thing. Um, and, I'm, and I'm beginning to be very proud of being both Indian and British. So, sir, what actually made you come back home? Well, I guess the world, or the, yeah, the world works in mysterious ways. And you're right, there is a sense of belonging and there is a sense of coming home. And the canonization of Mother Teresa is what brought me here. So last October, I did come back to Calcutta with Patricia. But that was a 20 year anniversary since we were last here. The last time we came here, we, we went to see Mother Teresa. And uh, in October, we just, our timetable just meant we could be here at the same time. And I had no idea that in December last year, 2015, we would all get news in the UK that His Holiness is going to uh, uh, make Mother Teresa probably into St. Teresa of Calcutta. And Patricia then said to me, you know, mothers always know what's right, don't they? Even if we don't want them to, but they always do. Um, she planted the seed into me and said, why don't you think about acknowledging um, what's about to happen in your own wonderful way? But also for, the, for, for all of my career, what I really should be is a photographer but I've just been on a massive divergent to do other things. And in another sense, Patricia said, you know, if you want to do something to, uh, uh, to pay homage to Mother Teresa and return to your love of photography, why don't you do um, something to do with photography and film? And that's how that ball got rolling. And, there, and then the words, memories of Mother Teresa came to mind. So sir, though your interests include photography, you're doing something totally different. You're a pilot. So, tell us something about that. Um, yes, I always, in looking up at the sky at the Missions of Charity, on the roof was an outside space. And when you are kite flying, you're naturally looking up at the sky. And every time I saw an aeroplane whiz by, I always wanted to be in one. And then one day you get in an aeroplane and the next day I went from AJC Boss Road to Auckland, New Zealand, to a beach, to a totally different landscape. And I was so blown away by the fact that this machine can take you from one place to another and I always wanted to be a pilot. And after um, finishing my career in the music business, I took over six to 18, about 18 months to fulfill my dream of wanting to become a pilot. The problem is people with disabilities, aviation or general aviation, aviation and lots of other sectors and industries are not accessible in terms of inclusion for people with disabilities. Aviation certainly is not gender equal. So it was partly to do with changing attitudes and partly not taking no for an answer. Why should okay. I not do what I want to do? Not because I don't want to do it, it's because you're stopping me. So I took it upon myself to try and find how I'm going to fly an aeroplane. I had help from a pilot at the Royal Air Force, who was a fighter pilot, and he started my training. So I was trained by some of the, the best pilots in the world. There are others um, in India, obviously. You've got a space industry. Um, 
and then afterwards I completed my training at a place called Cranfield which is very famous for aerospace and I had to find an aeroplane where I could install a hand control because I'm not going to use my, my feet. So that was another hurdle and there are lots of written exams and you have to have 85% to pass each one as a minimum. If you fail one of those 14 exams once, no, if you fail it, you're allowed to, sorry, <laughs> um, um, you can take an exam three times. But if you fail one subject out of the 14, you can't continue the course. So the benchmark is 85%. And then you complete your flight training. And one thing led to another and I qualified. And I don't know of many other people from India who have a disability who fly. So that's quite a nice feeling to say, staring up at the sky on the roof terrace of Mother Teresa in Calcutta, several years later, I'm actually in an aeroplane in the UK achieving my dream. So if the biggest thing that perhaps what Mother Teresa helped me to do was to achieve my dream of becoming a pilot. Um, just because I achieved what I achieved made me realize that there must be other people out there in the world who have the same vision and the same dream, but they just don't know how to do it. I felt very liberated when I achieved my license. There was a real sense of freedom and I had, it felt like electricity was flowing through my veins and suddenly there was a, you know, someone had reignited that uh, fire in my stomach and I had a, a new purpose to get out of bed every day. And I knew that there must be other people out there who wanted to fly aeroplanes but they had disabilities. So what I went to do was to set up a flying school called Freedom in the Air because it's about liberation from one's disability. There is nothing in there that says disability or ability. And I have, for the last almost 10 years, um, essentially put all the information out there so there is no longer a reason why people can't have a pilot's license with a disability What's harder to change is the attitude towards inclusion. So the best way to change that is just to get on with it and do it. And if the other people then realize that they're missing out, then that's their loss. And actually the way I sell it to the industry is it's the 21st century. It's based on competition. If you don't include women, if you don't include those with disabilities in your business model, you're losing out on an income stream. So it's a no-brainer if you're in the field of business to target all the audiences. And what we find is when we include disabled people, actually they end up bringing their friends. So it's a win-win. Um, all of our aeroplanes are fitted with um, hand controls, which means that they are portable, so you can take the hand controls bolter in, or you can take it out. Um, and that's it, uh, I, uh, uh, and it's great. I mean, we have trained people from all over the world now. Um, it's very uh, rare that when you ask, especially a child, to draw a picture of a pilot, what do you think they would draw? A pilot who's perfectly seated and, you know, who has all the equipment and is aware of what he's going to do. Well, I think most children would draw a pilot to look like a man. And certainly not one in a wheelchair or crutches. So that's what we're trying to change. So, sir, I'm sure you must be having a lot of hurdles because you're dealing with specially abled people. So what motivates you to go on with this, which is something so different? Well, if you look at the way Mother Teresa included everyone in her work, um, a lot of that, I guess, has bounced off on me. 
And I have lived all over the world and I have interacted with different people of cultures, colour, creed, religion, gender, sex. You know, it's a, it's a very small planet and as humans we're all pretty much the same. And I don't quite understand why you need to not treat everyone equally. So it's about equality. It's about not having injustice in the world. I'm not saying I want to change the world, but I certainly want to be able to give back to the world what it's given me. So sir, thank you once again for being with us today and sharing your story with us. I'm sure it's an inspiration for all. Thank you very much. It's been a lot of fun. So if you are in Kalkata this Sunday, the 18th of June 2016, do drop in to Mother House where the Missionaries of Charity are hosting a painting and drawing competition for all the unprivileged Sunday school children. To give your contributions and ideas, please drop in a line at the links below. And before we go, I have a question for your trivia bank. Who beatified Mother Teresa and when? We will be giving you this answer.